Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Situated in Pope County, Arkansas, Dover is a town nestled in the Arkansas River Valley and is included in the Russellville Micropolitan Statistical Area. Dover, Arkansas boasts a lower rate of violent crime compared to the national average, recording 13.3 incidents per thousand people, contrasting with the national rate of 22.7. Despite having a low crime rate, Dover became home to one of the most heinous massacres in the world. And the case takes us back to 1987, where the unthinkable took place involving a man named Ronald Gene Simmons. Ronald Gene Simmons, the son of Loretta and William Simmons, was born on July 15, 1940, in the city of Chicago, Illinois. A tragedy struck the family on January 31, 1943, when William Simmons, Ronald's father, passed away due to a stroke. In the wake of this loss, Loretta remarried within a year, tying the knot with William D. Griffin, a civil engineer affiliated with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Griffin's professional commitments led to the family's relocation, with the first move occurring in 1946 when the Corps transferred him to Little Rock, Arkansas. This marked the initial step in a series of relocations that would see the Simmons family traversing central Arkansas over the next decade. As a result of this, young Ronald never had a consistent set of friends since he was switching schools every few years. On September 15, 1957, 17-year-old Ronald made the decision to discontinue his formal education and enlisted in the U.S. Navy. His initial assignment placed him at the naval station Bremerton in Washington, where he crossed paths with 16-year-old Bersebi Rebecca Ulibari. This encounter blossomed into a union, and the two exchanged vows in New Mexico on July 9, 1960. Subsequently, over the following years, the couple experienced the joy of parenthood welcoming seven children into their family. In 1963, Ronald concluded his service in the Navy, and approximately two years later, he embarked on a new chapter by joining the U.S. Air Force. Throughout his commendable 20-year military tenure, Ronald garnered accolades such as the prestigious Bronze Star Medal, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross in recognition of his service as an airman, and the Air Force Ribbon for Excellent Marksmanship. His remarkable journey in the military culminated in his retirement on November 30, 1979, holding the distinguished rank of Master Sergeant. By 1981, Ronald had become a father to three sons and four daughters. In chronological order, they were Ronald Jean Jr., who is referred to as Jean, Sheila, William, Loretta, Eddie, Marianne, and Rebecca, who was lovingly called Little Becky. On April 3, 1981, the Cloudcroft, New Mexico Department of Human Services began investigating Ronald based on allegations that he'd fathered a child with his eldest daughter, Sheila, who fell prey to Ronald's assaults at the tender age of 17. As the investigation continued, Ronald found the noose of suspicion tightening around his neck. Fearing that he'd soon be arrested, Ronald fled New Mexico in late 1981 with his family. He first went to Ward, Arkansas, in Lenoki County, and then later to Pope County, Arkansas, five miles north of Dover, in the summer of 1983. The family settled on a 13-acre expanse of land situated approximately 6.5 miles north of Dover, affectionately naming it Mockingbird Hill. The residence they fashioned was a distinctive one, comprising of two older model mobile homes cleverly conjoined to create a more expansive and unified living space. Notably, the living quarters lacked modern conveniences such as a telephone and indoor plumbing. As a result of the home's lack of plumbing, Simmons orders his family to dig three cesspits. The home's surroundings were marked by a makeshift privacy fence skillfully erected to encircle the property. This fence, reaching heights of up to 10 feet in certain sections, 
not only served as a boundary, but also contributed to the family's sense of seclusion and privacy within their chosen home. Ronald took up a series of low-paying jobs in the close proximity of Russellville, Arkansas. His professional journey led him through various roles, including a stint as an accounts receivable clerk at Woodline Motor Freight. However, this employment came to an end amid multiple reports of Ronald making inappropriate advances at his female co-workers. Undeterred, Simmons transitioned to a role at a St. Clair Minimart where he dedicated approximately a year and a half of his labor before deciding to resign from his position on December 18, 1987. During this period of occupational shifts, notable changes occurred within the familial setting. The house now sheltered only seven members, as two of the older children, Billy and Sheila, left the family home, got married to their partners, and embarked on the journey of starting their own families. However, Ronald's eldest son, Jean, was still staying at the family home with his three-year-old daughter, Barbara. This marked a transformative phase in the Simmons family dynamics as the household adapted to these changes. Because of his dark past with his family, Ronald had failed to develop a healthy bond with any of his children. He didn't allow his kids to socialize or indulge in any fun activities. They weren't even allowed to go anywhere without him. Ronald's wife, Rebecca, faced these strong limitations as well. He eventually began to try and separate her from the children and from the outside world. In a series of letters, Rebecca, Ronald's wife, wrote to her son William, whom she called Bill, and she explained what she and the kids at home had been going through. She was having a tough time and she found some peace carefully sending letters to Bill. In one of her letters, Rebecca said, Dear Bill, Renata and Trey, Loretta may be staying in town Friday night, so I'll have her mail this. I've been thinking of all you said, Bill, and I know you're right. I don't want to live the rest of my life with Dad, but I'm still trying to figure out how to start. What if I couldn't find a job for some time? You have to remember I've never had a job since I've been married, or before that either. Now I have somewhere to start. It would be so much easier if it was just me, but I have three kids at home. So if you want to do any checking by telephone, go ahead and check, and we can talk about it when you come. I've decided if I borrow from Mum that I'd have her send it to you. I'm still all very confused, but like I said, I do know I don't want to stay with Dad, but don't want him getting more than he deserves. Yet sometimes I feel God is telling me to be more patient. Right now, I'll just say do some checking, and then it will help make my decision. I would like for Loretta to move in with you after she turns 18. She wants to go to college, and she can get a job too. I don't think San Antonio is the best place for her. El Jean and Wilma are back together, but they want to try it out and try to come get Barbara. I'm sure enjoying Barbara. She's a sweet, lovable, polite little girl. She's a good girl and we all love her and enjoy her so much. She always has us laughing. I'm so proud of Trey. The last time you came, Dad wanted to know how come you didn't stay long enough to see him too. Now that El Jean and Wilma are back together, I wish they could move from San Antonio. Barbara needs both her parents. They both have been through so much. I hope it works out. I love them both. Wilma wrote me a letter telling me she loves El Jean very much, and she must. She went back to him. I'm sure she's been hurt deeply. I want to see all my children happy. I've remembered a lot of what you said, Bill. I'm a prisoner here, and the kids too. I know when I get out, I might need help. Dad has me like a prisoner, that the freedom might be hard for me to take, yet I know it would be great having my children visit me any time, having a telephone, going shopping if I want, going to church. Every time I think of freedom, I want out as soon as possible. I don't want to put any burden on my children, and I think it's best I get out before I get too old. I want out, but it's the beginning. Once I get a job and a place, then I can handle it with the mental support of my children. I can do it. It was hard to talk in front of El Jean. He'd been having it so hard and his problems were deeply in my mind. I felt sorry for him. I was so afraid of what he might go back and do. You're lucky, Bill. You have a very good wife. She's led you the right way and that is toward God. She's very pretty too. I've always thanked God for sending you a good wife. I'm thankful for Dennis too. Give my darling Trey a lot of hugs and kisses for me. I love you all very much. Barbara gets bored if I take too long to write, so I hope I made sense in this letter. Hope Loretta can mail this Friday or Saturday on her way home. Love you very much, Mom.
P.S. You all looked so nice when you came. Loretta had a great time. Renata, she talked a lot about it. It seems pretty clear from the letter that Rebecca and the kids always feared Ronald and wouldn't want to do anything that would trigger his rage. Nobody could know what went on inside Ronald's head. And eventually, Ronald turned to his dark side and brought into action a plan so evil that it left the whole country in shock. Just a little before Christmas of 1987, 47-year-old Ronald decided to go on a killing spree. He began on the morning of December 22, 1987. His first victim was his 46-year-old wife, Rebecca, followed by his eldest son, 26-year-old Jean. Ronald bludgeoned them with a crowbar and then shot them with his 22 caliber pistol. Unfortunately, Jean's three-year-old daughter, Barbara, was on Ronald's list too. He strangled his granddaughter with his bare hands. Later that same day, Ronald dumped the three bodies in one of the cesspits he'd forced the children to dig. As the other children were at school when these murders took place, Ronald waited for them to come home. It was the last school day before the Christmas break, and the kids were excited for the holiday season, unaware that they would never get to celebrate it. As they all came back home, Ronald told them that he had presents for all of them, but would only give each of them one at a time. Ronald's 17-year-old daughter, Loretta, was the first of them to fall prey to her father's wicked schemes. As soon as Ronald was alone with Loretta, he strangled her and held her head underwater in a rain barrel. Ronald then killed his three other children in the same way. 14-year-old Eddie, 11-year-old Marianne, and 8-year-old little Becky's bodies were dumped in the same cesspit. Since it was the Christmas break, nobody would find out about the killings, and just four days later, on December 26, 1987, the remaining family members arrived at the Simmons house to celebrate, only to meet the same fate their other family members had met. Ronald shot and killed his 22-year-old son, William, and his 21-year-old wife, Renata, first. Next was William and Renata's 20-month-old son, William Jr., also known as Trey, who was strangled and drowned. When 24-year-old Sheila arrived with her 33-year-old husband, Dennis McNulty, they met the same tragic end when Ronald shot and killed them. Ronald's child was Sheila, 7-year-old Sylvia, who was under the care of Sheila and Dennis, was strangled and drowned, and finally, Sheila and Dennis's son, 21-month-old Michael, was killed the same way. Ronald laid the bodies in neat rows in the lounge and covered them with coats, except that of Sheila. Her body was covered by Rebecca's best tablecloth. Ronald wrapped Trey and Michael's bodies in plastic sheets and dumped them in abandoned cars at the end of the lane to his house. Right after committing the gruesome murders, Ronald headed out to a Sears store in Russellville to collect the Christmas presents he'd already ordered for his family. Before returning home later that night, he went for a drink at a local bar. The next morning, Ronald wasn't concerned the least bit about his actions. He spent the day watching television and drinking beer. By now, Ronald had killed all 14 of his family members. But he still wasn't done. On the morning of December 28, 1987, Ronald drove to a Walmart in Russellville and purchased another gun for the attack he was about to carry out. His next target was a 24-year-old woman named Kathy Cribbins Kendrick, who used to work as a secretary at a law firm. Ronald had met her during his time working at the same law firm. Ronald was infatuated with Kathy, but she'd rejected him. That very morning on the 28th, Ronald walked into the office and shot Kathy. She died within moments. Next, Ronald went to an oil company, and his target was the owner, Russell Taylor. Russell was also the owner of the Sinclair Mini Mart, from which Simmons had recently resigned. He shot and wounded Russell before shooting at two other people. While his shot missed Judy, the other man, 33-year-old James, wasn't so lucky. He became the only victim of Ronald, who was a stranger to him. Subsequently, Ronald went to Sinclair Mini Mart, where he unleashed a barrage of gunfire, causing injuries to two additional individuals. His nefarious journey led him to the office of the Woodline Motor Freight Company, targeting his former supervisor, Joyce Butts, whom he shot twice, only inflicting wounds. In a calculated move, Ronald then forced one of the employees at gunpoint to make a distress call to the police. Upon their arrival, Ronald, without any resistance, handed over his firearm and surrendered himself. Throughout this harrowing 40-minute-long rampage, the grim toll stood at two lives lost and four individuals injured. Since the Simmons family didn't have a telephone, following the arrest, 
law enforcement made their way to his residence to let the family know of the situation. It was at this point that they stumbled upon the horrifying discovery of the lifeless bodies of the 14 other victims. Following his arrest, Ronald underwent a thorough psychiatric evaluation at the Arkansas State Hospital in Little Rock, where he was deemed mentally fit to stand trial. The legal proceedings commenced with the trial for the murders of Kathy and James and concluded with a guilty verdict on May 12, 1988, and eventually Ronald was handed the death sentence. Notably, Ronald, under oath, further affirmed his support for the imposed sentence in an additional statement made during the proceedings which said, I, Ronald Gene Simmons Sr., wanted to be known that it's my wish and my desire that absolutely no action by anyone be taken to appeal or in any way change this sentence. It's further respectfully requested that this sentence be carried out expeditiously. Ronald faced another trial, this time for the murders of his 14 family members. The verdict was delivered on February 10, 1989, once again finding him guilty of the heinous crimes. The trial concluded on December 10, 1989, when Ronald was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Exploring potential motives, a family friend disclosed to investigators that Ronald's wife had been discreetly saving funds with the intention of divorcing him. Furthermore, testimony from the former supervisor of the freight company, who miraculously survived the shooting, shed light on Ronald's explosive temper. She told the detectives about an incident in which she got into an argument about wages with Ronald and he ended up shouting and screaming obscenities at her. During the trial, Ronald, at one point, had to be forcibly removed for resorting to physical violence. In a shocking display, he punched the prosecutor, John Bynum, and attempted to grab a deputy's handgun. This eruption occurred when Bynum introduced a letter exchanged between Ronald and his daughter Sheila, revealing Ronald's anger at her for revealing that he was the father of her child. In the letter, Ronald also said that he would see Sheila in hell. Remarkably, Ronald, despite his conviction, refused to appeal his death sentence. The legal proceedings delved into Ronald's competence to waive further appeals, leading the trial court to conduct a thorough hearing. Ultimately, the court concluded that Ronald's decision was made knowingly and intelligently. During his incarceration on death row, Ronald faced a unique set of challenges, leading to a segregation from fellow inmates due to persistent threats to his life. The reason behind this isolation was Ronald's steadfast refusal to appeal his death sentence. The other prisoners believed that Ronald was damaging their chances of beating their own death sentences. The unfolding events reached a critical point on May 31, 1990, when then-Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton signed Ronald's execution warrant. On June 25, 1990, Ronald met his chosen fate through lethal injection in the Cummins unit. The method of his demise was one he had specifically selected. Strikingly, none of his surviving relatives came forward to claim his body, and he was buried in Potter's Field in Lincoln County, Arkansas. Situated on the Atlantic coast of northeastern Florida, Jacksonville offers an attractive living environment with its reasonable cost of living, abundant beach access, southern ambiance, and the allure of a new home in the Sunshine State. However, it's important to note that the violent crime rate in Jacksonville is 698 incidents per 100,000 residents. This figure is 82% higher than the overall crime rate in Florida and 80% higher than the national average in the United States. With such a high crime rate, Jacksonville has witnessed many gruesome homicides over the years. But the one we'll be talking about today is the case of Michelle O'Dowd. What was supposed to be the most joyous time for her and her family back in 2011 turned into pure misery. Michelle Heidi Axt O'Dowd was born on February 20, 1944, in Glen Ridge, Essex County, New Jersey. Although not a lot is known about Michelle's early life, she was always known for her kind and caring nature, which eventually led to everyone affectionately calling her Mickey O. Michelle also had a twin brother named Axt, and the brother-sister duo shared an exceptionally close bond. In fact, Michelle used to work at a business owned by her brother, they were happy to see each other every morning before heading on to their usual day at work. By 2011, 67-year-old Michelle O'Dowd was living on her own at her Grand Reserve residence at 13810 North Sutton Park Drive in Jacksonville. She was living a peaceful life and could never have seen what was coming her way next. On the morning of December 2, 2011, a Friday, concern arose when Michelle failed to show up for work. In an attempt to reach her, Axed, her twin brother, 
tried calling her repeatedly, but received no response. Worried, he decided to visit Michelle's home and found it in disarray around 8.55 a.m. Amidst the chaos, he made a chilling discovery beneath the Christmas tree. Axed noticed a foot emerging from beneath the pile of presents. Alarmed, he touched the ankle and realized it was cold. Tragically, Michelle O'Dowd was found dead. Her bloodied face had been covered by a terry cloth towel. Axed immediately contacted the Jacksonville Police Department to report the incident. Sergeant Sean Corsi was one of the first ones to respond to the scene. Upon entering Michelle's apartment, he observed the disorder in her gated community residence, but found no apparent signs of forced entry. However, Michelle's debit card was reported missing, and the detectives refrained from speculating on the cause of death at that point. Notably, the crime scene included a peculiar detail. There is an empty vodka bottle in close proximity to the crime scene in the apartment. It was believed to be a deliberate staging by the perpetrator. Further into the investigation, it was later revealed that Michelle had suffered blunt force trauma and strangulation. The heartbreaking news was passed on to Michelle's family. Losing his twin sister in such a painful way took a severe toll on Axed. All he wanted now was justice for his sister. Diving deeper into the inquiry, detectives discovered that a family member had spoken with Michelle the day before. The family members said that they didn't notice anything unusual about Michelle's behavior. The family member also revealed that on the evening prior to Michelle's death, a family friend, considered close to the O'Dowd family, had been present at the gated south side home where Michelle stayed alone. The detectives identified that friend as 40-year-old Patty Michelle White. She was one of Michelle's nephew's ex-girlfriends, and the couple had lived together in South Carolina. Additionally, Patty was also a former roommate and family friend of Michelle herself. She'd often show up at Michelle's home unannounced. Axe said that his family had known Patty for four or five years, and even though she and his nephew had broken up, she'd still visit Michelle and would often stay overnight at her apartment. Axe pointed out that Patty had temporarily relocated to Orlando, but had recently spent about a month staying with Michelle. Patty's relationship with Michelle extended beyond mere friendship, as she had sought refuge with Michelle during challenging times. Axed and Michelle, in an attempt to help Patty financially, would compensate her for performing various tasks such as house cleaning and other odd jobs. Patty also assumed a caretaking role by occasionally babysitting Axed's grandchildren at times. Axed emphasized the integral role Patty played in their lives and even described her as an extended family member. In fact, Patty even knew the entry code to Michelle's gated apartment and had easy access. Attesting to Michelle's generosity and highlighting her kind and trusting nature, Axe told the detectives that Michelle entrusted Patty with errands such as grocery shopping, and so she had shared the PIN numbers for her debit and credit cards with Patty. Luckily, just a day after Michelle's merciless murder, it was revealed that Michelle's debit card, which had been stolen from her, had been used at two nearby bank ATMs. The transactions were made on the same fateful day Michelle was murdered. Surveillance photos showed Patty withdrawing cash from the ATMs and trying to conceal her identity. However, it wasn't hard for the detectives to confirm her identity, as she was ultimately recognized by Michelle's vigilant family members. Police, with the help of Michelle's family, corroborated Patty's involvement as the prime suspect in Michelle's homicide, which eventually unveiled a troubling narrative of deceit and betrayal. On the afternoon of December 3, 2011, a Saturday, Yorkville police officers conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle at around 3.40 p.m. The car was intercepted on East Liberty Street near College Street in Yorkville, South Carolina. The car was being driven by Patty's mother while Patty sat in the passenger seat. Upon being stopped, Patty willingly agreed to accompany law enforcement to the police station for an interview with Jacksonville detectives. Oddly, during the interrogation, Patty confessed to the murder of Michelle O'Dowd. Following the confession of the murder, Patty had relocated to South Carolina, residing with her parents in Yorkville. Subsequently, the Yorkville police obtained a fugitive from justice warrant, leading to Patty's incarceration at the York County Detention Center before she was extradited back to Florida. On October 14, 2013, she was handed a murder charge. Detectives uncovered robbery as the primary motive behind the case, but noted that something had gone extremely wrong during the execution of the plan. According to investigators, Patty had returned to Jacksonville with the intention of robbing Michelle. On Tuesday, October 15, 2013, 
a judge handed down a sentence of 45 years in prison to Patty Michelle White, then 41 years old. Patty had pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for the killing of Michelle O'Dowd in December 2011 and had managed to avoid a potential life sentence through a plea agreement to the lesser charge. Cincinnati, Ohio, located along the banks of the Ohio River, is a vibrant city known for its rich history and diverse cultural offerings. With a skyline adorned by iconic structures like the Great American Tower, the city boasts a thriving art scene, historic neighborhoods, and a passionate sports culture. In the 1930s, Cincinnati bore the indelible marks of the Great Depression, impacting the economy and daily lives of people, yet the city resiliently pushed forward. Despite the hardships, the city maintained its spirit, setting the stage for the vibrant metropolis it would become in the decades to come. It was within this spirited backdrop in 1931 that a crime unfolded, a unique occurrence that would leave an unprecedented mark on the city. The tale begins with a young couple hailing from Cincinnati, Ohio. 27-year-old Joseph Edward McLean and 22-year-old Mildred Dedden exchanged vows on October 6, 1925. Despite their youth, they were full of enthusiasm as they embarked on this new chapter of life, eagerly anticipating the arrival of their first child. A mere month later, on November 29, 1925, their daughter Marion McLean made her entrance into the world. At the time, Joseph was employed as a machinist, and Mildred worked as a machine operator. Though not affluent, they possessed everything necessary to nurture their growing family. Unfortunately, the idyllic family bliss didn't stand the test of time. As the Great Depression gripped the U.S., job opportunities were scarce. Around 1930, Joseph found himself relocating to Phoenix, Arizona in search of employment. Meanwhile, Mildred remained in Cincinnati, Ohio, juggling work and the responsibilities of single-handedly raising their daughter. Over time, the couple's separation became permanent, and they decided to part ways. Mildred and Marion lived in a tenement building on Pendleton Street, a location now occupied by the parking lot for the Bell Event Center. As 1931 drew to a close, the holiday season was in full swing for many, but six-year-old Marion's home didn't share the same festive spirit. During that fall, Marion had her tonsils removed. The surgery kept her confined to the hospital and then housebound for a period of 14 weeks. However, on December 17, 1931, she was feeling better and wanted to go outside to find her friends and play on the streets. It was a Thursday and surprisingly warm, almost like spring. So Mildred gave her permission to go outside with a reminder to play nearby and not leave the vicinity. It was the first time in several months that Marion had been allowed to go outside of the house. Little did Mildred know that this one decision would haunt her forever. I love you, Mother. Will you see that old Santa Claus brings me all kinds of toys? These would be the last words Mildred would hear from her daughter. Wearing a blue chinchilla coat, a blue and gray check dress, a blue hat, and black stockings, she excitedly stepped outside. However, she never joined her playmates. In less than 20 minutes after Marion walked down the four flights of steps from the apartment, she fell into the clutches of a stranger who abducted the child and fled the scene. This heartbreaking incident occurred in front of a drugstore in Pendleton Street, and the druggist promptly informed the police. The police swiftly jumped into action, scouring all the streets and sidewalks for any sign of Marion, but she remained elusive. As the officers talked to witnesses, some vital details emerged. The man last seen with Marion McLean was described as around six feet tall, weighing approximately 170 pounds, and he seemed thin. His complexion was reported as dark, hinting at foreign parentage. He was clad in a dark suit, and his age was estimated to be between 35 and 40 years old. Upon receiving the news, Mildred was devastated, and her heart shattered into pieces. She sobbed in fear, tormented by the dread of potential harm befalling her little girl. Joseph, too, as soon as he heard, was en route from Arizona to join in the desperate search. How did this news affect the community, you might wonder? This was more than a tragedy for a single family. The entire city felt the weight of the loss. It became one of the gloomiest Christmases ever in Cincinnati, with everyone ardently praying for the safe return of the child. Yet underneath the collective hope, there lingered an unsettling fear. Sharing Marion's photo along with her description, the police sought public assistance. 
The child stood at 3 feet 6 inches, weighing 40 pounds with light blonde hair and a straight ball parted on both sides, a fair complexion and blue eyes. A distinctive strawberry birthmark adorned her shoulder blade. The Inquirer, a tabloid newspaper, offered a $1,000 reward for information leading to Marion's recovery, and the kidnapper's capture spurred the community into action. Marion's image graced the front pages of almost every newspaper in town, inundating the police with tips from the concerned public. On Friday, December 18, 1931, a Newport woman reported witnessing two gypsy women dragging a girl along 8th Street. Responding to the lead, two police officers were dispatched to nearby camps, but found no success. Simultaneously, police rushed downtown after receiving reports of a man carrying Marion in a sack into a hotel. However, the officers quickly determined that the man was a ventriloquist, leading to a false alarm. Tensions escalated over the weekend, and by Monday, December 21, 1931, city officials announced the commencement of the most thorough manhunt ever undertaken in Cincinnati the following day. 4,000 Boy Scouts were mobilized to search the Pendleton area, while over 100 firefighters conducted basement-to-attic searches of all the homes, leveraging the perception that people might be more willing to open their doors to firefighters than to the police. Five days after her abduction, on Tuesday, December 22, 1931, just before 10 p.m., Marion was discovered in the cellar of a house at 428 East 12th Street. The house belonged to a 45-year-old shoemaker, Charles Bischoff, and was merely a block away from her residence at 1105 Pendleton Street. However, the one who found Marion wasn't a Boy Scout or a firefighter. As the search for Marion unfolded, a crowd gathered to observe the firefighters diligently checking every corner and space for the missing girl. Interestingly, a team of firefighters was just a few doors away from his place when Charles Bischoff suddenly emerged from his cellar, urgently exclaiming, A dead child! A dead child in the cellar! He rushed up the steps, holding the lifeless body of six-year-old Marion in his arms, revealing the tragic outcome. Mildred arrived at the scene immediately after receiving the news of her daughter's body being discovered. Although the location of her child was now known, the heartbreaking truth remained that they couldn't be reunited in life. While the mother's loss was immeasurable, it was also a challenging task for law enforcement officials. Two tear stains, one on each cheek of the deceased child, served as poignant evidence that deeply affected even the typically unemotional men in law enforcement. These tear stains revealed that Marion had cried incessantly during the time she was with her abductor until her life was tragically cut short. The Christmas of 1931 left a haunting darkness in the hearts of the people of Cincinnati. Marion's body, except for the black sateen bloomers and a portion of her underclothing that had been torn off, remained fully clothed. The discarded bloomers and underclothing were found nearby, and a small knife stuck in the ground near her body showed no signs of bloodstains, leading the police to discount it as a clue. According to the autopsy reports, the child had endured repeated assaults between the time of her abduction and the moment death mercilessly ended her agony. Her torso was mutilated and she'd been choked. Marion's cause of death was determined as shock and hemorrhage resulting from the assaults. The autopsy also indicated that she'd been dead for at least 24 hours before being found. However, whether Marion was alive or not when she was placed in that cellar couldn't be determined. There was no evidence in the musty cellar to suggest that an attack had occurred there. Detectives speculated that, due to the absence of blood in the cellar, the assault likely happened elsewhere, perhaps in the immediate neighborhood. This raised the puzzling question of why no one had heard anything, especially considering the heightened awareness of Marion's story and the community's vigilance against suspicious activities. Bischoff maintained that he went to his cellar that morning to get kindling wood and discovered the body. However, he claimed that on Monday night it wasn't there. This raised the question of how Marion's body could have been placed overnight without anyone hearing anything. Another perplexing question emerged. Monday night saw heavy rain, and any brief stay outside would have soaked garments that weren't waterproof. If Marion's assailant brought her into that cellar on the same night, he must have shielded her with a waterproof cloak as her clothes were found dry. Detectives considered the only other possibility that Bischoff might be lying. After several days of suspicion, Charles Bischoff was taken into custody. Two days after Christmas, Marion's body was laid to rest. 
Six young girls carried the casket of their six-year-old playmate, dressed in a pink dress with silk stockings and satin slippers. The small casket was covered in pink velvet. Joseph, Marion's father, was flown from Phoenix, Arizona by National Airlines to Covington, making it in time for the funeral. Despite their long separation and impending divorce, he and Mildred wept side by side at the loss of their child. The funeral took place at the now-demolished St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Covington, Kentucky. Marion was buried at Mother of God Cemetery on Latonia Avenue, Kenton Vale, Kentucky. After the funeral, Mildred gave an interview to a newspaper expressing the immense difficulty in coping with the loss of her only child. She shared the heart-wrenching realization that she wouldn't hear the footsteps of her little one when she returned from work, nor would she be able to enjoy her daughter's innocent babbling. Mildred also conveyed the poignant fact that Marion's last wish was to receive gifts from Santa, and now Mildred's home was filled with toys but lacked the laughter of her child playing with them. A newspaper published a photo of Mildred holding all the Christmas toys meant for Marion. The only thing Mildred sought now was justice. On the other hand, although the detectives had Charles Bischoff in custody, they lacked sufficient evidence to conclusively prove his guilt. The year 1932 rolled in without shedding any light on the mystery. Police went through every inch of Bischoff's cellar hunting for evidence, even excavating the dirt floor, but luck eluded them. The use of electric lights, quite a feat in 1932, was employed to aid the investigation. Advanced scientific methods were applied to test Marion's stomach for opium to see if she'd been drugged. In a thorough sweep, every home within a mile of the cellar was scrutinized to uncover the crime scene. Despite these exhaustive efforts, no promising leads emerged. Throughout this period, Bischoff remained behind bars, persistently declaring his innocence even as investigators frequently subjected him to intense questioning. Captain Lynn Black, a 34-year-old World War I veteran, had joined the Hamilton County Sheriff's Force just eight months prior to Marion's tragic death. Driven by ambition, Black faced the daunting challenge of solving Marion's case, well aware of the mounting public pressure. Feeling the heat, he devised a plan, setting the stage for a twisted tale in criminal investigation marked by a dramatic confession that continues to be remembered for its theatrics. Black's strategy was set in motion on January the 11th, 1932, which marked Bischoff's 20th day in jail without formal charges. After rehearsing it with other deputies, Black donned a disguise. Brandishing a revolver, he stormed into the room where Bischoff was under guard in a jail cell. Locking up the deputies in a bathroom, Black dragged Bischoff to the basement. Posing as Marion's relative, Black claimed to know that Bischoff had killed her. At gunpoint, Bischoff admitted he might have killed her, but couldn't remember. Maintaining the charade, Black escorted Bischoff back to the cell and left him there. Following the plan, the deputies were eventually released from the bathroom and quickly apprehended the disguised Black. The deputies forcefully ushered the disguised Black into a nearby room. From the adjacent room, Bischoff heard sounds of slams, punches, and screams of pain. Meanwhile, the deputies were busy banging tables with books and smearing black with red ink. After a few minutes, the purportedly beaten man was dragged past Bischoff's cell, apparently breaking his nerve. Bischoff told the deputies that he might have killed the girl in a fit of insanity. They promptly had Bischoff sign a confession to that effect. He presented his confession, now in its third or fourth draft, to reporters the next day. Observers noted that he appeared confused during the interview, at times retracting parts of what was written in front of him. Nonetheless, he confessed to murdering Marion McLean, aligning with what the authorities sought all along. It's the chair for me, Bischoff said. Circumstantial evidence, that's what they call it, that's it. They've got the goods on me. In his confession, Bischoff detailed the kidnapping, claiming he took Marion into his cellar on December 17, 1931, after abducting her. He admitted to assaulting her and then leaving her there alone, bleeding but alive, with a sweater gagging her. According to his account, when he returned on Friday morning to check on her, she was dead. Bischoff claimed he cleaned up the area where the attack occurred and moved her to another part of the cellar. Despite the coroner and pathologist insisting that she died on Monday, contradicting Bischoff's statement, the police dismissed his version as a lie, 
and any discussion of an alternative crime scene was abandoned. Captain Lynn Black and his fellow deputies received widespread praise for the ruse that led to the confession. The courtroom was filled to capacity on the first day of Charles Bischoff's trial on January 13, 1932, turning the event into a major spectacle in Cincinnati. The crowd was so overwhelming that 20 deputy sheriffs were stationed to maintain order. Charles Bischoff, escorted by guards and navigating through the sea of spectators, entered the courtroom and stood before Judge Charles S. Bell. Having already been indicted for Marion's murder the day prior, authorities aimed to ascertain whether he was culpable for any additional crimes. Years before Marion's tragic abduction and murder, Cincinnati experienced similar disappearances. The first was that of nine-year-old Emily Gump, who vanished on November 9, 1919, after being seen playing with neighborhood children following an event at St. John Church in Cincinnati. Less than two years later, on August 21, 1921, Another nine-year-old, Frida Hornberger, disappeared after leaving a bakery in Cincinnati, not far from Gump's home, where she'd purchased goods. There was no trace of her. Intriguingly, both children lived near Charles Bischoff's tenement. Authorities suspected that Bischoff might have been involved in these disappearances. In the courtroom, Bischoff mostly responded with nods and silence. When questioned about whether he had ever harmed any child other than Marion, Bischoff denied it. Outwardly calm, he displayed no apparent distress over his situation and maintained that he was sorry but couldn't help it. Judge Bell granted him until 2 p.m. the next day to name his attorney for the trial, but the trial never took place. On February 9, 1932, Judge Bell sent Bischoff to the Lima State Hospital for the criminally insane for a 30-day observation where doctors concluded that he was delusional. He'd remained there until his death in 1947 at the age of 60 and the Ohio Department of Corrections has no record of his burial location. Today, aside from the fading newspaper clippings and her gravestone, there aren't many reminders of the six-year-old Marion McLean, whose 1931 abduction and murder cast a dark shadow over Cincinnati during the peak of the Christmas season. People remain divided into two camps regarding Bischoff's innocence. Whether he was guilty of those crimes, we leave it to you to judge. We hope you stay safe and enjoy a wonderful Christmas with your own family. Situated in England and nestled along the River Avon, Bristol holds the status of a city, ceremonial county, and unitary authority. Renowned for its appealing qualities, Bristol consistently earns accolades as one of the finest places to reside in the UK. Notably, it stands as the exclusive European green capital within the United Kingdom. The city's strategic location ensures easy access to urban amenities, picturesque countryside, and the inviting coastline. In terms of safety, Bristol maintains a reported violent crime rate of 32.8 incidents per thousand working individuals annually. This places it as the 38th lowest crime rate among the 99 postcode areas in England and Wales, underscoring Bristol's commitment to fostering a secure and desirable living environment. However, Bristol isn't completely safe from all dangers. Back in 2010, when Christmas was just around the corner, 25-year-old Joanna Yates's life took a tragic turn. Joanna Claire Yates, a British woman, was born on April 19, 1985. Her proud parents, David and Teresa Yates, welcomed her into the family in Hampshire, England. Joanne, as she was affectionately known, had the privilege of receiving her education in a private setting at Embley Park near Romsey. In her family circle, she had a brother named Chris who stood by her in her life's journey. Joanna pursued her A-levels at Peter Simons College, showcasing her dedication to academic excellence. Subsequently, she delved into the realm of higher education and earned a degree in landscape architecture from Riddle College. Not content with just an undergraduate education, Joanna furthered her academic pursuits by obtaining a postgraduate diploma in landscape architecture from the esteemed University of Gloucester. Her educational journey not only reflected her commitment to learning, but also showcased her passion for her chosen field. In December of 2008, during her professional tenure at the esteemed firm Highland Edgar Driver, situated in Winchester, 23-year-old Joanna crossed paths with a 25-year-old architect named Greg Reardon. Joanna and Greg's professional relationship eventually blossomed into a personal connection, 
leading to the couple deciding to take the significant step of moving in together in the year 2009. As the romantic journey progressed, Joanna and Greg relocated to Bristol when their work-related commitments brought them to this vibrant city. Joanna, showcasing her versatility, later transitioned to a position at the Building Design Partnership in Bristol, marking a new chapter in her professional endeavors. Soon, Joanna and Greg made the decision to settle into a residence at 44 Caninge Road in the Clifton suburb of Bristol. This particular abode, situated within a larger house that had been subdivided into several flats, became their shared haven in October of 2010. While everything was going well in Joanne and Greg's life, just three months later, tragedy struck. On the evening of December 19th, 2010, at approximately 8 p.m., Greg returned to their shared flat after a weekend visit to Sheffield, only to discover that Joanna was nowhere to be found. Their cat, however, was still in the apartment. Alarmed by the inability to get in touch with her through phone calls and text messages, Greg, while anxiously awaiting her return, made a concerning discovery. Greg found Joanna's mobile phone neatly tucked away in the pocket of her coat, which remained in the apartment along with her person keys. By then, Greg was in a complete panic. He decided to take action and reached out to both the police and Joanna's parents shortly after half-past midnight to officially report her missing. This marked the beginning of a distressing chapter in the lives of Joanna's loved ones, prompting a community-wide effort to unravel the mysteries surrounding her sudden disappearance. Following a thorough investigation, it was established that Joanna had spent the evening of Friday, December 17, 2010, in the company of her colleagues at the Bristol Ram Pub situated on Park Street. Although she left the pub at approximately 8 p.m. and headed for a 30-minute stroll home, she never arrived at her apartment that night. Joanna's friends and colleagues told the detectives that Joanna didn't want to spend the upcoming weekend alone as Greg wouldn't return till late Sunday, December 19, 2010. The friends also said that apart from engaging in Christmas shopping, Joanna had made plans to fill her time with baking preparations for an upcoming party she and Greg had intended to host the following week. The detectives were able to track Joanna's movements from that night to a Waitrose supermarket. Notably, surveillance footage captured showed Joanna leaving the supermarket at around 8.10 p.m. without making any purchases. Subsequently, at 8.30 p.m., she reached out to her best friend, Rebecca Scott, to discuss their plans for Christmas Eve. The next visual record of Joanna showed her purchasing a pizza from a Tesco Express branch at approximately 8.40 p.m. In addition to the pizza, she bought two small bottles of cider from a nearby off-license bargain booze. These details provided a glimpse into the final moments of Joanna's evening before the mysterious circumstances surrounding her disappearance unfolded. In an effort to locate Joanna, her circle of friends and Greg took proactive measures establishing a dedicated website and utilizing social networking services to help search for her. On December 21st, 2010, a joint public appeal for her safe return was made by Joanna's parents and Greg during a police press conference. In another press conference, which was aired live on December 23rd, 2010, by both Sky News and BBC News, David and Teresa Yates, Joanna's parents, addressed her mysterious disappearance and shared their suspicions that Joanna might have been abducted. If I had to pick a daughter, I couldn't pick anybody else. And I miss her terribly. Just break I was going to say, clearly you're so distraught about this. What is it that you are missing most at the moment? Can I ask you, Mr. I'm missing being able to hold her, and cuddle her, and just say everything's all right. And 
I just want her back wherever she is. Joe, my little Joe, come back. And if anybody's got her, don't, don't keep her. Give her back to us. We miss her so much. I know that's obvious. And nobody can feel the pain that we feel. But we want to thank absolutely everyone who's been helping us, her school friends, her best friends, her college friends. They just Emma and Becky and all the friends and her cousins and everything. Just want to thank everybody for what they've done. They've done posters and way beyond. And and Greg and Facebook, which we know nothing about, but all the youngsters just done what they can with what they know and just come back, Joe. I'd like to just ask you a bit about the last time you were in contact with her and the last time you spoke yeah. to her. What was that conversation like and how did she sound? Well, um, I, I, I came down to Bristol a couple of weeks ago because I was going with a couple of friends to Deal or No Deal and I said to Jo, can I come and stay the night? I mean, I don't assume anything. And she said, great, love to see you, Mum. And so really I spent the evening with her and Greg in the flat and I stayed there and then the next morning I went off quite early and um, they were still there and we were possibly going to meet up later. Um, we didn't because the thing ended quite early and uh, she had meetings and I just texted her and, and she texted me saying, did you get there okay? And I think that was the last time I, I really had much contact with her. I think we spoke a bit about Christmas and I said, can you make some mince pies? And that's what she was going to do this, this weekend. She, she'd printed something off the internet. I saw it in her diary. And I knew that she was going to do that. Although David was still uncertain of what actually happened to her, based on the circumstances, he shared his belief that she may have been taken after returning to her flat. David Yates expressed conviction that Joanna would not have left her belongings behind voluntarily and added that she must have been taken somewhere else against her will. We knew Jo wouldn't take off by herself. She's never done it before. Um, she's always had her own space. And uh, it, it isn't her. She, she loved the position she was in. She adored it. Obviously, you must be turning this over and over in your minds, and many scenarios must go through your minds. Has the thought occurred to you that someone close to Jo may have been involved in her disappearance? And how do you cope with that? I don't think anybody close to has been involved with her disappearance. Not close. No. Um, unless, some, unless something happened which suddenly got out of control. Like, um, I don't know what close people Joe has down here. Um, but of the people that we know down here, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, not for a second. No. And again, forgive me for asking this, but when you go through all these scenarios, you must have contemplated that there could be a dreadful outcome. Yeah. How do you cope with that, Mrs Yates? I'll ask you that. I go numb. With all this snow around, I sometimes picture her like, if for some reason she had collapsed or had been discarded and she was alive, it was all the snow and the cold. I just <laughs> can't bear the thought of it. I don't go with it. Detectives initiated an investigation into the mysterious circumstances. Back at the apartment, detectives found no signs of the pizza or its packaging Joanne had purchased while both the bottles of cider she'd bought were discovered in the flat and one of them had partially been consumed. Um, I know that from CCTV, she went to Tesco's in Clifton Village and she purchased a pizza. Um, I have here a pizza which is similar in all respects to the one we believe she purchased, which is a Tesco's finest um, tomato, mozzarella and basil pesto pizza. Within the flat we can find no evidence of this pizza or any of the wrappings. And so I would like to make an appeal, firstly for anyone who has any information about where Joanna is, is now, or any information about that so can indicate what's happened to her. But I'd also like to make an appeal for anyone who knows where this pizza is, or whether any of the wrappings are, or where the box is. As there are no signs of forced entry or struggle, investigators began exploring the hypothesis that Joanna may have known her abductor. 
Well, the jury left Bristol Crown Court this morning and took the route that Joanna Yates would have taken herself that night on December the 17th as she came home here to Canning Road. They walked the last bit of the journey and then they went inside flat one, number 44, Canning Road. On the inside, they were shown the window in the kitchen that the defence said yesterday would form a part of their case. They then got to look round the rest of the flat including the living room, the bedroom and the bathroom. On the inside, you could see clearly uh, where the police investigation had occurred. The carpets had been taken up. There was evidence, evidence of forensic dust all over the walls where they had been looking for fin fingerprint and, and uh, forensic detail. There was also inside the flat a sense of the time of year when this happened, an unopened box of crackers, tinsel uh, on the curtain rail and... Uh, an unopened, perhaps, Christmas card that was lying on the floor. From here, the jury were then taken to where Joanna Yates's body was left in Longwood Lane. The disheartening turn of events continued as, on December 25, 2010, a fully clothed body was discovered in the snow along Longwood Lane near a golf course and the entrance of a quarry in Fairland. The site was approximately three miles from Joanna's residence, Police officially confirmed the body as that of 25-year-old Joanna Claire Yates. Visiting the site of the discovery on December 27, 2010, both Greg and Joanna's family grappled with the somber reality. David Yates, Joanna's father, acknowledged the family's preparation for the worst and expressed some relief that Joanna's body had been recovered. However, funeral arrangements were temporarily delayed as investigators retained possession of the body for further examination. The unfolding narrative of Joanna's disappearance and tragic discovery marked a profound and sorrowful chapter for those close to her. In response to the heightened sense of vulnerability in the community, authorities issued orders urging residents to secure their homes and cautioning women against walking alone after nightfall. Operation Braid, an extensive investigative measure to hunt for Joanna's killer, had a formidable team of 80 detectives and civilian staff operating under the leadership of Detective Chief Inspector Phil Jones, a seasoned officer heading Avon and Somerset Constabulary's Major Crime Investigation Unit. This operation unfolded as one of the most substantial police efforts in the Constabulary's history. Detective Chief Inspector Jones requested the public to come forward and provide any information that could aid in nabbing the perpetrator. The detectives were particularly interested in those witnesses who had been in the vicinity of the Longwood Lane in Fayland before the discovery of Joanna's body. Emphasizing the significance of community engagement, Inspector Jones said that the investigation had received an overwhelming number of tips from citizens. This led the officers to diligently pursue every lead and location presented to them. Police looked through over 100 hours of surveillance footage along with 293 tons of garbage collected from the vicinity around Joanna's residence. In an effort to direct more attention towards Joanna's case, Crime Stoppers offered a £10,000 reward claimable for anyone who would provide information leading to the arrest and conviction of the murderer. Additionally, the Sun newspaper contributed to the cause by offering a £50,000 reward. Addressing the ongoing murder investigation, Joanna's father, David, shared his doubts that the perpetrator would voluntarily come forward. Nevertheless, he maintained a hopeful outlook, placing trust in the diligence of the police force that eventually they would catch the person responsible. Detectives hailing from the Avon and Somerset Constabulary took to comparing Joanna's case with some other similar ones to see if there's a connection. Their focus zeroed in on cases such as the strangulation of 20-year-old Glennis Carruthers in 1974, the disappearance and subsequent discovery of 25-year-old Melanie Hall's body 13 years later in 1996, and the mysterious vanishing of 35-year-old Claudia Lawrence in 2009. Melanie Hall's case caught the most attention due to the striking similarities that it had with Joanna's case. Their age, physical appearance, and the commonality of both of them disappearing right after returning home from socializing with friends. While initial speculations leaned towards potential connections, the authorities later threw this theory away. The police collected surveillance footage from Clifton Suspension Bridge, a key part of the shortest route from where the crime occurred to the Clifton suburb where Joanna was last seen alive. Unfortunately, the video quality wasn't good, making it impossible to clearly identify people or read car registration numbers. 
Investigators knew that the person responsible might have chosen a different bridge south of the River Avon, less than a mile away, to avoid being caught on CCTV cameras. Even though the post-mortem examination began on December 26, 2010, the release of results was delayed due to the frozen state of the body. Initially, the police considered the possibility that Joanna Yates might have died from freezing because there were no apparent signs of injury on her body. However, on December 28, 2010, investigators declared the case a murder inquiry. The pathologist conducting the autopsy determined that Joanna had died from strangulation. The postmortem suggested that she'd passed away several days before being discovered. Notably, it was confirmed that Joanna did not eat the pizza she'd bought. Detective Chief Inspector Jones clarified that the investigation uncovered no evidence to suggest that Joanna had been assaulted. In the routine course of the inquiry, the police examined Greg Reardon's laptop computer and mobile phone. Greg was subsequently eliminated as a suspect and treated as a witness. Detectives were eventually able to get some crucial information from some witnesses. A young woman who attended a party at a nearby house on Cannons Road on the night Joanna Yates was missing recalled hearing two loud screams shortly after 9 p.m. that night. According to the woman, the screams originated from the direction of Joanna's apartment. Another neighbor residing behind Joanna's home reported hearing a woman's voice shouting for help, although the exact timing of the incident was uncertain. To explore the possibility that the perpetrator had entered the flat before Joanna returned home on December 17, 2010, the night of her disappearance, investigators removed the front door of Joanna's residence to examine for clothing fibers and DNA evidence. Around 7 a.m. on December 30, 2010, Christopher Jeffries, who was Joanna's landlord and lived in another flat within the same building, was arrested on suspicion of her murder. While the forensic investigators conducted an inspection of his flat, he was taken to a local police station for questioning. A senior police officer granted investigators a 12-hour extension to the arrest, allowing for additional questioning. Multiple requests for extensions were approved on December 31, 2010 and January 1, 2011. While investigators were permitted to detain him as a suspect for up to 96 hours, Jeffries was released on bail after two days. He sought legal representation from the law firm Stoko Partnership to act on his behalf during this period. The investigation's senior officers took assistance from the National Policing Improvement Agency, an organization providing expertise for challenging cases. To enhance the investigative process, a clinical forensic psychologist with prior experience as a criminal profiler in notable murder cases joined the team on January 4, 2011. The goal was to narrow down the pool of potential suspects. Detective Chief Inspector Jones affirmed that his team had pursued over a thousand lines of inquiry and expressed determination to solve the crime and bring the perpetrators to justice. On January 5, 2011, he disclosed that one of Joanna Yates's socks was missing when her body was discovered and it hadn't been located at the crime scene or in her residence. In a joint effort to gather more information, the police initiated a national advertising campaign leveraging social media platforms like Facebook. Within a day of it being established on January 4th, the campaign's page garnered nearly 250,000 views, while CCTV footage of Joanna on YouTube amassed 120,000 views by January 5, 2011. The authorities aimed to leverage public awareness and engagement in hopes of unearthing crucial details that could aid in solving the case. On January 9th, Carrie McCarthy, the Member of Parliament for Bristol East, expressed her support for the idea of a public DNA screening process if deemed helpful by the police. She shared a past instance from 1995 when the Avon and Somerset Constabulary had conducted mass DNA screening during the investigation into the disappearance of Louise Smith. McCarthy proposed extending the screening beyond Clifton to cover the broader Bristol area. Authorities tested the DNA found on Joanna Yates's body to potentially create a profile. Additionally, detectives initiated the tracking of the movements of several hundred registered sex offenders residing within their jurisdiction to establish their whereabouts on December 17, 2010, when Joanna disappeared. On the morning of January 20, 2011, the Avon and Somerset Constabulary arrested Vincent Tabak, a 32-year-old architectural engineer living with his girlfriend in the flat next door to Joanna Yates. However, authorities chose not to disclose additional details during the interrogation of the suspect. 
This decision was influenced by concerns about the controversial media coverage following the arrest of Christopher Jeffries, Joanna's landlord, which had violated the regulations governing what can be reported when an individual is arrested. Tabak's arrest stemmed from an anonymous tip provided by a female caller shortly after Joanna's parents made a televised appeal on Crime Watch, a TV show where UK's best detectives work together to solve Britain's biggest murder mysteries. To facilitate investigative procedures, Caninge Road was closed by the police and scaffolding was erected around Joanna's house. Simultaneously, officers sealed off Tabak's adjacent flat. The investigators also conducted a search at a friend's townhouse where Tabak was thought to have been staying approximately a mile away. Notably, Tabak had been previously eliminated as a suspect during an earlier phase of the investigation and had returned to the UK from a holiday visit to his family in the Netherlands. While Tabak was being investigated in January 2011, a reenactment of Joanna's case was already in the process of being filmed in Bristol for the BBC programme Crime Watch, and the episode was scheduled to air on January 26, 2011. To recreate the snowy conditions during Joanna Yates' disappearance, a specialised film industry firm was hired. The filming of Joanna's last movements took place on January 18, 2011. Within 24 hours of news coverage about the production, over 300 people contacted the police, leading investigators to believe that Joanna's body might have been transported in a large suitcase. However, after Vincent Tabak's arrest, the BBC decided not to broadcast the reenactment of Joanna's case on Crime Watch. However, previously unreleased photos of Joanna were made public through the program's website on January 31st after they cancelled the broadcasting of the episode. In order to solidify the evidence of Tabak's involvement in Joanna's murder, DNA tests were conducted by LGC Forensics, a private company specializing in forensic analysis for criminal investigations. Lindsay Lennon, a body fluids and DNA specialist on the analysis team, stated that although DNA swabs matched Tabak, the quality was not sufficient for evaluation. A team utilized a method called DNA Sense, enhancing unusable DNA samples through purification and concentration. Lennon mentioned that the scientists couldn't determine whether the DNA was from saliva, other bodily fluids, or touch, but they were able to confirm that the probability of it not being a match with Tabak was less than one in a billion. After being interrogated for almost 96 hours by various detectives, Vincent Tabak was formally charged on January 22, 2011 with the murder of Joanna Yates. He briefly appeared in Bristol's Magistrates' Court on January 24, 2011, and was detained in custody. Represented by Paul Cook, Tabak chose not to seek bail during a hearing the following day. Due to concerns for his safety, Tabak was relocated from Bristol Prison and placed under watch at Long Larton Prison near Evesham so he couldn't harm himself. In the Netherlands, Tabak's family and friends initiated fundraising efforts to support his legal defense. Initially, Tabak asserted his innocence in Joanna Yates's death alleging that corrupt officials had fabricated DNA evidence linking him to the crime. However, on February 8, 2011, he confided in Peter Brotherton, a prison chaplain, admitting to the killing and expressing his intention to plead guilty. Vincent Tabak was born on February 10, 1978. He was a Dutch engineer who'd been residing and working in the United Kingdom since 2007. He was the youngest of five siblings, and along with them, he was brought up in Uden, Netherlands, located 21 miles north of Eindhoven. John Masseurs, Tabak's childhood next-door neighbor, described him as an intelligent yet introverted loner. Tabak commenced his studies at Eindhoven University of Technology in 1996, completing his MSc in Architecture, Building and Planning in 2003, before pursuing a PhD in the same field. Upon leaving university in 2007, he relocated to the United Kingdom after securing a position at the headquarters of Bureau Hapold, an engineering consultancy firm in Bath. Tabak settled in a flat in the town and worked as a people flow analyst, where he mainly focused on studying how individuals navigate public spaces like schools, airports, and sports stadiums. During his time in Bath, he entered into a relationship with a woman he first met on The Guardian's online dating website, Soulmates. This woman, whose name was never disclosed to the public, became Tabak's first serious girlfriend. The couple moved to a flat in Caninge Road, Bristol, in June 2009. Despite Joanna and her boyfriend Greg moving into the neighboring flat in Caninge Road in October 2010, she and Tabak didn't cross paths before December 17, 2010. 
After murdering Joanna Yates, Tabak tried to divert suspicion onto Jeffries by falsely implicating him in the crime. While spending the new year with relatives in the Netherlands, Tabak watched a news broadcast about the case and decided to contact the Avon and Somerset police. To keep himself in the clear, he framed Jeffries and claimed that Jeffries had used his car on the night of December 17, 2010. In response, CID officer DC Karen Thomas was sent to Amsterdam to interview Tabak. They met at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport on December 31, 2010, where Tabak expanded on his story. However, Thomas became suspicious of his keen interest in the forensic work conducted by the police, and his account didn't align with a previous statement he'd made to Officer Thomas. It was also revealed that in the months leading up to Joanna's murder, Tabak used his computer during business trips in the United Kingdom and the United States to research escort agencies. He also contacted several escorts by phone. Additionally, for his pleasure, he viewed violent videos on the internet which showed women being controlled by men. Some other search results from Tabak's internet history led the detectives to websites depicting images of women being bound, gagged, held by the neck, and choked. Furthermore, during the murder investigation, police discovered images of a woman who strongly resembled Joanna. In one scene, when the woman was undressing, she was seen taking off her pink top. Notably, when Joanna's body was found, she was wearing a similarly arranged pink top. On January 31, 2011, the pathologist Nat Carey approved the release of Joanna Yates's body to her relatives. Her family organized a funeral at St. Mark's Church in Amfield, Hampshire, and she was finally laid to rest in the churchyard on February the 11th, 2011. Around 300 people attended the service and said their goodbyes to their beloved Joanna, promising to forever keep her in their prayers. On March 4, 2011, Christopher Jeffries, Joanna's landlord, was released from jail. Clearing him of having any involvement in Joanna's murder, the police declared that he was no longer a suspect in the case. He was later given an undisclosed sum in libel damages for defamatory news articles which had been published post his arrest. Avon and Somerset Police issued an apology for any distress caused to him during the investigation. On May 5, 2011, Vincent Tabak pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Joanna Yates but denied the charge of murder. While all his hearings had been conducted via video calls from prison, on September 20, 2011, Tabak personally appeared at a pretrial hearing at Bristol Crown Court, where the Crown Prosecution Service rejected his plea for manslaughter. Vincent Tabak's murder trial commenced on October 4, 2011, at the Crown Court in Bristol, presided over by Mr. Justice Field and a jury. William Clegg, Queen's Counsel, served as Tabak's counsel, while Nigel Lickley, Queen's Counsel, acted as the prosecutor. Tabak again admitted to manslaughter, but denied the murder charge. According to the prosecution, Tabak had strangled Joanna Yates shortly after she came home on the night of December 17, 2010, using enough force to cause her death. The prosecutors highlighted the fact that Tabak, being significantly taller than Joanna, used his height and physical strength to overpower her. He allegedly pinned her to the floor by her wrists, resulting in 43 distinct injuries which hadn't been initially disclosed to the public. Joanna had injuries on her head, neck, torso, and arms during the struggle, which included cuts, bruises, and a fractured nose. Prosecutors claimed that the confrontation was prolonged and her demise would have been slow and agonizing. However, they didn't provide an explanation for the motive behind Tabak's initial attack. The court was presented with evidence suggesting that Tabak attempted to cover up the crime by disposing of Joanna's body. DNA swamps from her body were a match to Tabak's profile. Samples from behind the knees of Joanna's jeans indicated that she might have been held by the legs as she was being carried. Fibers found on Joanna's body confirmed contact with Tabak's coat and car. Bloodstains were discovered on a wall near a quarry close to where Joanna was found dead. The prosecution also alleged that Tabak had previously tried to frame Christopher Jeffries, Joanna's landlord, in the murder during the police investigation. Additionally, in the days following Joanna's death, Tabak allegedly conducted internet searches on topics such as the decomposition time of a body and the schedule of trash collections in the Clifton area. During Tabak's trial, Prosecutor Nigel Lickley QC argued that the jury should be presented with evidence of Tabak's activities, suggesting it could provide insights into the duration and force required to take a person's life. 
The prosecution also didn't include details of Tabak's internet surfing history as the judge deemed it insufficient to establish premeditation. In his defense, Tabak admitted to murdering Joanna, but asserted that the killing was not driven by indecent motives. He told the court that he unintentionally killed Joanna Yates while attempting to silence her as she screamed when he tried to kiss her. According to Tabak, Joanna had made a flirty comment and invited him to have a drink with her. He claimed that, in response to her scream, he placed his hands over her mouth and around her neck to quiet her. Tabak rejected the notion of a struggle, asserting that he held Joanna by the neck with minimal force for approximately 20 seconds. He informed the court that after disposing of the body, he was in a state of panic and couldn't process what he'd done. The jury commenced deliberating on October 26, 2011, and delivered a verdict just two days later. Vincent Tabak was a cunning, dishonest and manipulative man who knew exactly what he was dealing, doing when he killed Joe Yates. Today he's been convicted by a jury of her murder last year, despite claiming he meant her no harm. He was cunning and dishonest towards his girlfriend, with whom he maintained a normal relationship, even going so far as to text her shortly after Joe was dead to say he was bored. He manipulated the police by virtue of his in-depth research on the internet to keep one step ahead of the investigation before his arrest, looking up extradition and medical details of decomposition. He made very selective admissions surrounding the circumstances of Joe's death, which sought to cast her in an unfavourable light, and he kept this up even when he was giving evidence to the jury. Tabak thought his cleverness and deceit would prevent him from being convicted of a brutal murder. He was wrong. On October 28, 2011, with a 10-to-2 majority verdict, Tabak was found guilty of murdering Joanna Yates. He was given a life sentence with a minimum term of 20 years. Post-trial, it was revealed that Tabak's laptop contained some sensitive images of children. In December 2013, the Crown Prosecution Service announced his prosecution for possessing these images. On March 2, 2015, Tabak pleaded guilty to possessing over 100 indecent images of children and he was handed a 10-month prison sentence which would run concurrently with his existing life sentence for Joanna's murder. As Tabak's trial was going on, another controversy had been making the rounds attracting widespread media attention. The British media's means of reporting on certain aspects of Joanna's case resulted in a temporary ban on television broadcaster ITN from participating in press conferences related to the matter. After a television news report on January 4, 2011, said that the detectives were being lousy and suggested that the police were making limited progress in their investigation. Although the police later lifted the sanctions against ITN, they warned them that if they adopted similar tactics in the future, the police would not be as lenient. In an article for London's Evening Standard on January 5, 2011, Roy Gleanslade, a media commentator, voiced his growing concern over a series of disparaging articles targeting the character of Joanna Yates's landlord, Christopher Jeffries, right after his arrest. These articles that had already surfaced in various newspapers convinced many readers that Jeffrey was, in fact, guilty. Greenslade characterized this media coverage as a form of character assassination on a large scale and highlighted specific instances that exemplified the trend. Among them was a headline in The Sun which portrayed Jeffrey's a retired schoolmaster from Clifton College, as weird, posh, lewd, and creepy. The Daily Express featured a story quoting unnamed former students who labeled him a sort of nutty professor who made them feel creeped out by his strange behavior. Furthermore, the Daily Telegraph reported that Jeffries had been described by students as a fan of dark and violent avant-garde films. Jeffries said that the reporters had besieged him after he was questioned by the police. They began a frenzied campaign to stain his character by publishing a series of very serious allegations against him, which were completely untrue. He added that it was quite evident that the tabloid press had decided that he was guilty of Joanna's murder, and that they seemed determined to persuade the public into believing that he was guilty. In response to this perceived media onslaught, Jeffries took legal action on April 21, 2011, against multiple newspaper companies, seeking damages for libel. On July 29, 2011, Jeffries came to an agreement to receive substantial damages for defamation from all the newspaper companies that had a contribution toward tarnishing his image in the public. In the same ruling, the court declared that two specific newspapers had committed contempt of court. 
As a consequence, the Daily Mirror faced a fine of £50,000, while the Sun was fined £18,000. And it was finally a win for Jeffries.